Hello, everyone. Welcome to the controller session with Jay Hun. Lovely to see you. Um, and thank you very much for coming because I know 11 o'clock at a festival is a little bit like when you were a student and you thought, oh my God, double English at 11, I'll never get there, it's so early. So thank you for coming and getting here and being part of it all because it's going to have a very, very fun hour. We are embracing the social media age. Eric Schmidt will be delighted with us. So you can tweet all sorts of questions. It should be up there at all times. There you go, hashtag SIDLAW. You can tweet through any questions you want and I can put them to Jay as we go along. So, welcome. I think we need a little round of applause for her. Come on. I think we do. I think we do. I love that you get a round of applause for turning out. That's I know. Hard. I know. Can I go now? <laughs> very, very nice to see you. I'm going to run through, because everybody knows you, but some people might not, the fools. It won't be like, this is your life, but just a brief history of you, and you can tell me what I've got wrong along the way. Um, began career as a researcher with the BBC. That's true, isn't it? Worked on Newsnight, was editor of Panorama. Uh, in charge of no, one I wasn't editor of Panorama. You were? No, but I worked on Panorama. Oh, OK. Should have been editor <laughs> of Panorama. <laughs> I'll insert that. OK. Um, one o'clock and six o'clock news, then controller of BBC Daytime. Then you left the BBC in 2007 yeah. to go to five. Yeah. And then, of course, returned to be controller of BBC One. And then September last year announced you were leaving to come and be chief creative director. Officer. Officer. Which so I think what, sounds like I need a uniform and a hat. It does, but doesn't yeah. it? Why, why that title? I don't know. Where did it come know. from? I don't know where it came from, actually. I think there's a CCO is a recognised title, but it's a slightly old one, and I do feel slightly sort of military about it, but yeah. So that's what it became, and took up the post in January. Yeah. So you've been in the job eight months. We're talking about yeah. a whole year. Yeah. So anything that happened before eight months, you can blame on everyone else and take well, responsibility for the other. I don't see it in quite that <laughs> vein, but yeah. <laughs> so, and also a little bit about you. You were born in Sydney, weren't yeah. you? And, and, and were you there till teenage years? I was there till my teenage years, which I think is some defence for why I don't know any puppets on television, but we'll just <laughs> let that one go now. But um, yeah, so I was brought up in Australia, but I lived in Greece and in Pittsburgh and then in England, then went back to Australia and eventually settled in England when I was about 13. Does that affect you, do you think, in terms of, uh, of, of some of your decisions? Do you view things slightly differently? I mean, I think the great luxury of it is that you are an outsider in one respect, and I think occasionally that can be quite refreshing. I also think it's given me... I don't know, I think if I didn't do this job, I'd be a travel agent. I mean, I'm absolutely obsessed about travel and I love the idea of having that sort of different perspective from around the world. But no, I and mean, I think the luxury for me is that you have that slight distance. So I feel British and I am now British, but I've got a slight remove because it's not entirely part of who I am. Right, okay, brilliant. We can talk about your active nature, general fitness, but later on as well. And you're a mum. Yep. Two children. Yep. Ten and five? I've got an 11 year old and a five year old, yeah. Right. So this is like a Grazia interview now. I'm know, very happy with this. this. Are we is, moving on to shoe size? I know. This is, oh, be no, good for exactly. Me. <laughs> How many shoes do you? I have no. a huge number of do shoes. You? I do. Oh yeah. my God, this is yeah. all turning up. Martha, I, I feel so much more comfortable in this zone, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, and I will ask you later how you do that, because I think it yeah. is extraordinary, that juggling, and there's, there's so many women not want to know, but that's purely for my benefit, so we'll leave that, because I'm sure the delegates don't necessarily need to hear. And you cycle, so you cycle to work when you're at the BBC. Yeah. So, do you cycle to work now? I sometimes cycle to work. It's not quite as far, because I live in Clapham, so it wasn't quite the sort of great exercise workout that it had been cycling seven miles to the beach. Because yeah. I wondered if maybe your decision to leave the BBC was that it was a shorter <laughs> distance to work. <laughs> Is no, that the reason why you went for? I mean, I'm sure there's some working mums and cyclists in the audience, but the whole thing of getting to the Beeb and having to either shower or run into a disabled toilet, change into sort of controller, rush into the office was... <laughs> I don't miss that enormously, it must be said. <laughs> so it wasn't to do with distance recycling. So before we go on to talk about the, the brilliant things that happened in Channel 4 and, and the last year as well, why did you make that decision to leave? Well, it's weird sitting here now. I think I was literally sitting in this auditorium in this seat when I was asked that this time last year. Mm. And it was an incredibly difficult decision to leave the BBC. I mean, running BBC One is one of the great jobs that you do in broadcasting. I absolutely loved it. And I had a very happy time at the BBC. But the Channel 4 job is so much part of who I am. I feel instinctively quite a Channel 4 person. I've always well, been well, what huge... What is that, then? What well, there's that something the... about the irreverence of it. I mean, it goes back, back a little bit to that outsider point of view. The sense of, you know, punching authority on the nose, being irreverent, having a sense of real mischief about what you do but with a purpose is absolutely one of the reasons I work in television so I've always been attracted to Channel 4 as a viewer I was very envious of a lot of the brands they had even when I was sitting on one so when a job came up that said do you want to come and run not just the main channel but a whole portfolio mm. of channels and really really important for me actually was going somewhere where the multi-platform activity was utterly integrated so it feels like we made a huge step forward in terms of what the future will look like that I don't manage a linear team of commissioners and multi-platform commissioners I manage a huge team of creatives and that, mm. that's a massive massive task and was a hugely appealing 
feeling opportunity. So I felt I had to take mm. it. Because, I mean, I don't work for the BBC, although I have been lured by people like yourself into humiliating experiences like Strictly, but generally, I don't work for the BBC, so I don't know, this is only what I've read and heard, but there was a sense that the situation with Satsgate and, and various other events that happened made sort of the BBC a, a, a more claustrophobic place to be creatively. That wasn't part of your decision to leave, was it? No, it genuinely wasn't. I mean, it's the same. I mean, from BBC One, it's just one of those things that mm. will stay with me forever, and I'm thrilled with what I achieved there. I was really pleased with how the channel looked and felt when I left. But, but there is something about Channel 4 which absolutely gets under your skin, and it's strange. You know, I couldn't be more proud to walk across that bridge at Horsbury Road every single day, and you wonder when you leave the BBC, will you constantly be looking over your shoulder thinking, you know, I wish I'd stayed? And I don't ever think that. I, I think... What we do is extraordinary and is an extraordinary part of the broadcasting landscape and I'm just really, really proud to be at Channel 4 and it seems to me it was absolutely the right move. Wow. <laughs> Very good. What, what makes you most proud when you look at that? Was it the testicles, be honest? Uh, that's not testicles, that's a great apron of fat, Kate. You've got to watch embarrassing oh. boys. Um, I think there are loads of things there which in different ways makes me incredibly proud. I look at Hugh's fish fight and I just think, I can't believe we did that. You know, policy on fish mm. discard is going to change because of a Channel 4 campaign. You know, mackerel sales are going through the roof. I and mean, it's just an extraordinary thing to have done. Jamie's Dream School discussed in Parliament looking at how we mm. feel about the way we educate our kids. But then alongside that to have something like Friday Night Dinner, which is a completely different flavour for comedy on Channel 4, to have Seven Dwarves as a new popular hit. And in a sense, one of my favourite shows there, 24 Hours in A&E, that, that absolutely spine-tingling mm. sense of what it's really like like inside the modern NHS. Well, there's a huge amount there that I feel incredibly proud to be involved with. Yeah, I'm rightly so. Now, you won Channel 4 won Professor Channel of the Year last year, uh, and you maintained on its share of 7%, which is one of those things that David Abraham said wanted to do. Are you confident that you can still do that? Well, I'm going to try really, really hard. I mean, I think... Whichever way you look at it, it's going to be quite a tough year. I and mean, it's a bit like the equivalent of ITV getting through a year without a Simon Cowell show in place. I mean, not having Big Brother there will, will affect our performance to some degree. But I think I'm do incredibly cheered. Do you wish they'd kept Big Brother? Did you, did you, did you sort of start in January thinking... I cannot believe there isn't a Big Brother in the show. Hand on heart, I wouldn't have come to Channel 4 if Big Brother had still been there. I feel really, Why? really strongly about that. Why? Because the appeal to me of this job was to come in with the promise of trying to get Channel 4 to a different place, to utterly creative renew it. And I sit there and I've got you know, well-funded genres that have had a top-up of over £73 million as a direct consequence of Big Brother not being in the schedule. So I couldn't really churlishly sit here and say, oh, I'm sorry, it's not there. Mm. I genuinely wouldn't have come to the channel had it been there. So the opportunity for me now is to say, well, what does the next phase of Channel 4 look like? And that is about doubling our spend in drama, nearly tripling our spend in comedy and entertainment. So that, to me, is an incredibly exciting prospect. And even so, when you look at the ratings this week and Channel 5 beating Channel 4 at that slot because of Big Brother... Yeah, but, I, you know, Kel surprise. <laughs> I mean, I sit there and think it's not an arms race. At the end of the day, the, the fate and the health of a channel is judged over a long period of time. I and mean, it's a bit like saying, I could sit there and say to Peter Fincham, well, you know, we had you on the run last Wednesday when Dwarves outperformed ITV at nine o'clock. I mean... That would be as ridiculous. I, I think at the end of the day, Channel 4 is an incredibly good place. The portfolio is up year on year. Our share of 16 to 34 is up. You know, in January, we outperformed Celebrity Big Brother from last year. In June, the main channel outperformed what it was doing last year with Big Brother in the schedule. So it feels to me they're in a really good place. So, so but then, you know, it is an arms war, isn't it, though? Isn't it? Isn't it an arms war? Isn't, isn't it about ratings? I mean, what, what, what is success for you in terms of Channel 4 if it isn't ratings? Well, I don't think it is purely racing. I mean, one of the reasons purely, that my, no, but, but one of my the reasons I have spent my entire career in public service television is because I believe in public service television, and that is defined by a great deal more than just ratings. And of course, you want shows to cut through with viewers. You want to make the most compelling lineup you possibly mm. can. But the appeal to me of being at Channel Four is that. We will sit there and say, OK, last week we had the street season, you know, a season no other channel would have done, shining a really bright light on urban culture. No one else would have done that. Or Tuesday night we had uh, Debbie Tucker Green's new drama, Random. Extraordinarily brave piece of commissioning. Never going to be a huge ratings winner, but incredibly important part of the mix of what we do on 4. So... It's important that the channel is robust and it's important that people are watching it. Of course it is. We've got commercial imperatives that drive that. But success to me looks like that tape. It looks like that sort of eclectic mix of extraordinarily powerful popular hits like, like Dwarves and 24 Hours in A&E sitting alongside big campaigning pieces of journalism, new drama like The Promise. And that's what a really robust and powerful Channel 4 looks like, I think. So how do you, you mentioned products and products, how do you balance that then when you've got things like Deal or No Deal? How do they fit into that for you? Is that sort of, well, that's something to keep those people happy. Do they still fit in 
to that PSB idea for you? I mean, I don't, I never think of it as a grid. I mean, one of the things I find refreshing about David's approach to the way we talk about funding at four is it's a very, very clear articulation of where we are. You know, mm. we don't get any public money. We need to pay our own way. And it's absolutely true that certain parts of the schedule allow us the luxury of doing things like The Promise or doing any human heart or, you know, some of you over this weekend will have seen um, the new comic strip that we've got for this autumn, which is one of my real highlights of the autumn. We can afford to do those pieces because we have things like, you know, Grand Design's doing a great job for the channel or some of the documentary series like One Born Every Minute really cutting through. And there's a very clear relationship between the two. So talk to me about creative renewal, this, this phrase. What, what does that mean as far as you're concerned? Well, I think it's about having a sort of root and branch look at every part of the schedule and everything that we do. And I've been, you know, tiring myself out doing that since January. And that means looking again at what we do in daytime. Have we got that right? I and mean, we put more money into daytime to make sure that we have as compelling an offer there as we possibly can. Thinking again about what we're doing at eight o'clock. Have we got the hits shows of eight o'clock and the big features pieces that define Channel 4 coming down the line? Thinking again about what we do at 10 o'clock and 11 o'clock. We should be competitive in off-peak slots as well. So it's very much doing a detailed analysis of what we're doing, working out what we're doing right, being prepared to get rid of brands that aren't working and being prepared to carve out space to do the new and the different. And that's what I've been doing. So, because, so it doesn't just mean then, or it doesn't only mean courting controversy, because there are reports that David Abrahams was encouraging you to do things that would grab headlines that would court controversy. I think that's largely misreported. I genuinely do. I mean, David, in my experience, has no appetite for let's go and cause trouble for no reason. I mean, this phrase that he's coined of a, a mission with mischief, to me, is exactly what we're there to do. I mean, one of the reasons I'm excited about things like Comic Strip or Charlie Brooker's big satirical series for, for this autumn is they say something interesting about Britain today. They're out there and they're making some <coughs> brave decisions and some brave comments about the way in which we all live and work. But they're done with a purpose. They're not just caught in controversy for no reason whatsoever. And I think that, that's the very, very important line that we need to tread. I'm not interested in causing trouble for no reason. Do you think in some ways that can, that can hamper you? Because if you look at things that haven't gone so well, like Seven Days, and compare it to TOWIE, mm -hmm. TOWIE doesn't have that sense of sort of worthiness about it, which Seven Days, I think, as a viewer, did. Mm. And maybe that's why Tarry was a hit and Seven Days wasn't. Well, no, I mean, I look at Made in Chelsea, for example, which is the most tweeted about show we've had on Channel 4 this year, an extraordinary standout hit for E4. And, I, you know, it's not that we can't do pieces that can feel just straight out there entertaining. We absolutely can do that. Um, and I think Seven Days is really interesting. I mean, one of the most, the most extraordinary things for me about changing the way in which I work at 4 to the way it was at the BBC is now, I now manage multi-platform commissioners. And that really makes you think differently about success and failure, because in a multi-platform world, nothing ever fails. It's just a sort of iteration on the way to getting it right. Right. And mm. I think you look at something like Seven Days, which palpably didn't work brilliantly as a linear programming, as linear program. But the interactivity around that's been really interesting and it's informed quite a lot of development that we've got going forward. So I think it's important for four particularly, which has got a sort of unique responsibility around trying the new and the different, that we have a slightly more sophisticated discussion about what success and failure look like. And mm. I think we are getting better at that. So something like Four Rooms, for example, which launched over the summer, really different flavour for the channel got there sort of 85%. I think we've gone again with that because it will get there next time round or 10 o'clock live. Very, very happy to have had it in the schedule. I think we'll tweak it slightly and go with it again. And I hope that's what creative renewal will look like. We'll try things. They may not all work first time out, but we'll finesse them and go again or we'll get rid of them and start again. But mm. it's a different way of looking at success and failure. And is it true that you turned down Towie and do you regret that? Not as far as I know. It certainly wasn't ever pitched to me. OK, all right. Well, that's answered that question. Uh, a quick chat really about the Alpha Fund and, and diversity and getting different sorts of, uh, of indies in. How, how are you going to practically make that happen? Because it has been criticised that you do focus on a, a core number of people you trust. Yeah, and I've been on a, a, bit, a bit of a crusade about this since I arrived. I think at last count, I've now seen 180 different companies in seven months. And that's been briefings in Cardiff, briefings in Manchester, mm -hmm. big sessions in London. I'm off to Glasgow next week. You know, I think we're, Channel 4 has a unique reliance on the independent sector. We don't have a big in-house production. We need to get the best ideas through the door and we need to have the best conversations. And you know, one of the reasons I put so much of my own time into it is I think it's really important. And there was a small moment, it sounds a bit schmaltzy this, which I was so thrilled about this week. So on Wednesday night, we put out Wallace Simpson, The Secret Letters, rated for the channel. We're back in history again, which is fantastic. Sizable ABC One audience. But in a sense, the most heartwarming thing about the entire story. It was, it was made by a tiny Indian whale called Telescope, who six months ago didn't ever think they'd get through the door at Channel 4 and certainly wouldn't have had the ambition of pitching for a nine o'clock piece. So it is working. We're out there having the conversations and we're commissioning the shows and that's what success looks like. 
And you, what are you looking for? That's what they want, how they want to know. What are you looking for? Is there something that you're desperate for someone to pitch for you? <laughs> I don't think so, because I'd just go and ask them for it if it was as simple as that. I mean, no, I mean, <laughs> when I think about creative renewal in all slots, I'm like, I mean, I'm genuinely, the one thing I would say to you is we have got money, we have got an appetite to take risk, and we want to go out and make some new shows mm. in all genres. And I've been, you know, banging on about this as I travel around the country, but I think... You know, what that means in reality is, if you're a factual producer, brilliant, we're back in history, we're back in science, we're looking for great big specialist factual events, we're looking for, you know, documentaries that are beyond the rig, what is the next generation of documentaries going to look like, what does documentary as event television look and feel like, we're looking for drama for 10 o'clock that will serve a younger audience, we're looking for event drama for 9 o'clock, I mean, there's very little that we're not looking for, and I think, in a sense, that's another very positive outcome from Big Brother, we have money to spend in all genres, the budgets have gone up sizably, and we're looking for great ideas. You said you disagreed with that. Let's start no, no, with what No, no, I don't disagree with that. I don't think there's anything in there that I disagree with. I think that's absolutely right. We've got a job to go and find some big new hits. I think Lorraine's right. I think it probably is a strategic failure that we haven't got a great big pile of things. But, you know, I'm eight months in. We're going as fast as we possibly can. We're mm. putting a huge amount of effort and energy and money into entertainment development. And we're looking for that show. But, I mean, I think it's been really interesting for everyone in the industry across the summer to see ITV and BBC One huge number of entertainment shows launch, not one of them really cut through. I mean, it's a really stark reminder to all of us what a very, very difficult genre it is. So they don't, you know, come along very often, but you've got to work really hard to find them. How do you, I mean, how do you do that then? How do you find that big sort of juggernaut, game-changing, channel-defining show? Because it's interesting when the other points picked up there that there has to be consistency as well. So it's a, it must be such a balance between risk and keeping a channel for feel. How, how do you do that? Your yeah, process. but I mean, you know, to be honest, having been at five and at one, I don't mm. think that changes massively. Wherever you are, you need those absolute stalwarts of the schedule that drive volume, that bring people in, who will sample the newer offerings that you've got. I mean, I think if there were an easy solution to finding a big hit show, then you would have seen more big hit shows on, mm. on bigger, better funded channels recently as well. So, I mean, I think it's a hard thing to do, but you go out there and you look for it. It's as simple as that. And it's one of the reasons that my approach to creative renewal is very much twofold. It's about saying, this is what we want to achieve strategically. Let's Let's get out there and have the conversations with the people who can make these shows because we're never going to find it if we're not out there having the conversations which is why I've taken that big move into diversifying our supply so very seriously. Let's look at our living big brother for a moment. Let's look at some of the other things. So Frankie Boy has travelled on nights. He's got a new project, hasn't he? A rehabilitation programme. Um, what, what do you feel? Do you, I mean, what do you, did you feel about Trammelled on Nights? What did you feel about the whole situation with Katie Price? Is there a moment for you where it went too far, where Channel 4... How far is too far for Channel 4? What's well, interesting on that? I mean, I wasn't at four at the time no. that it went out, so it's very much looking at it all with hindsight. I mean, one of the things that's impressed me about coming to four is how much detailed editorial and compliance rigour goes into signing off every single one of those jokes in a controversial piece like that. And I think Channel 4's got a brilliant reputation for pushing the boundaries, for doing the risky comedy, for going further than other people will go. And I absolutely want that to continue on my watch. But that has to go hand in hand with responsibility around some of these things. I mean, hand on heart, I don't think Tremor Old Nights was a great show. It's less a reflection on that joke. I just don't think it was a great show it doesn't mean that Frankie Boyle isn't a talented comedian and I think if we could find the right sort of vehicle for for Frankie then we could absolutely bring him back to the channel so is rehabilitation program it I don't know it's a pilot so I mean you know in a sense right. that I think the great thing about channel four is we don't have big blacklists of people who don't appear on the screens ever again because they've done something wrong I mean at the end of the day Frankie Boyle is a talented comedian if we can find the sort of show that will work for him then we'll bring it back very very early days this may or may not be it it's difficult though isn't it for the people that, that, that are making shows for you and come to tip what you'd say it's a difficult one because um, do you think that, that Channel 4... I don't feel that Channel 4 apologised. I don't remember seeing them say, I'm sorry. I mean, they talked a lot about this type of show will cause offence. We had no desire to cause offence. And there must be a pressure on people making shows for you that they... Do they have to decide where the line is drawn, or are you very clear on it? Not at all. I mean, I, I think today's sponsored by broadcasters. Isn't it? I mean, there's a brilliant broadcast survey of our um, of all of all broadcasters and the sort of editorial, legal, and compliance teams that they work with. At which Channel mm. Four came out right on top. And I think one of the things that's been utterly remarkable to me, genuinely life transforming in terms of my professional life, is seeing how extraordinarily strong our legal and compliance teams are. And you know, anyone who works for Channel Four, you walk through the door and you've got someone standing shoulder to shoulder with you every step of the way. And I think that. That's extraordinary. You are mm. backed every step of the way. You are offered that help every step of the way. That decision never sits with you. It's a decision that you take together with a huge amount of advice and consultation. So I certainly don't think suppliers should feel vulnerable in that conversation. And looking at some of the bumps, so seven days we talked about famous and fearless and the event. Do you know why they didn't work? Yeah. Why? Well, I mean, you know, I think 
famous and fearless is absolutely a, a good thing to have tried and say, you know, I hadn't arrived at the time. I think it's right that Channel 4, along the way of, of experimenting, should try big shows. I think the interesting thing is that Red or Black, in many respects, feels to me like a show that's in a quite a similar space, but they've taken the scale even bigger. And I think you know, one, of, one of the issues I think we have with famous and fearless is it wasn't big enough. So... It didn't quite so work. So it hasn't put you off making big bets? No, you've got to make big bets. I mean, I think what's so interesting about audience behaviour now is that their tolerance of the same stuff is going through the floor. They have a huge appetite for the new and the different. So in a sense, it's great for creative leaders now. You've got to take a chance because you're going to lose people by continuing to do more of the same or something a bit like something I've seen on another channel. I think there's a massive imperative around jump off a cliff. You know, mm. have a parachute, ideally, but jump off a cliff. Mm. And in terms of entertainment, have you hand on heart, sort of given up on Saturday nights, really? We haven't given up, but I mean, you know, not least having come from one and, and looked at the sort of uh, ratings battles between one and ITV, I think you've got to be pragmatic about what you can achieve. I know the budgets that are going into Strictly and into X Factor, and I think you've got to ask yourself, is that a good use of money from a Channel 4 point of view? I think what we've got to think quite hard about is how it doesn't look like we've put up a white flag on a Saturday night. There is a huge audience who are not served by reality television who want to watch something else, so I think we can mop up, but I also think we can look at other ways of doing entertainment away from some of the those great big juggernaut pieces, but we can still bring in an audience. And I've been incredibly encouraged by the way in which our change to the Friday night lineup has already been picked up by audiences. We've just seen a big tracker survey around brand perception on Channel 4, which shows that Channel 4 on a Friday night with our new entertainment lineup is, is regarded as the best channel for entertainment for 16 to 34s. And that's been achieved in seven weeks. So we know there's audience appetite for us to get entertainment right. We've just got to find the right sorts of pieces and schedule them imaginatively. Shows like Million Pound Drop, which have been a hit, I've just seen you do training the new series, which looks all glitzy and it did occur to me when I was watching those trails on Channel 4 um, that it wouldn't sit uncomfortably on ITV1 so what makes it different or are you happy to think that works on ITV1 we're going to do a bit of that no, because I think that's deeply naive, particularly in entertainment. If you, if you say, well, that worked on ITV1, we're going to copy it. First of all, the audience will bust you every day of the week. Secondly, we probably cannot afford to resource it to the same level, so it won't look as good. Mm. What's interesting to me about Million Pound Drops is it's got a very clear proposition. It's, it is quite a mainstream hit, but what sits alongside it in terms of the interactivity is utterly groundbreaking. So, mm. you know, we have learned so much around play-along, around second screens, about how you can enhance the audience experience through that show. Mm. So much so that the next series of Million Pound Drop, if you want to be on the show, you will only be considered if you've been part of the play-along audience, which to me is absolutely where we should be. We've taken that idea of multi-platform engagement to a whole new level. We've just moved wholeheartedly into the future and said, if you want to be on the linear show, you've got to be playing along at home. Mm. And I don't think any other channel's doing that. So, yes, it's a mainstream show, but it's got a lot of innovation in the way that it works. We've got some tweets coming in, which can I say I just want to applaud you for, because Jay speaks very quickly and I speak very quickly. And the idea that you can tweet questions at our speed is, is massive dexterity. But here we go. Uh, here's one. Is there any room on Channel 4 for foreign subtitle drama in the way BBC4 has the, the brilliant killing? Well, you know, I think we've rather democratically got a version of the killing in a language we can all speak, and I'm very, very um, proud, proud of that. I think, I think that's, that's gone very, very well. So, I mean, I, I, you know, at the end of the day, am I looking for a huge amount of subtitle drama? I could lie, but no. <laughs> no. Brilliant. Uh, is, new comedy, is new comedy working on Channel 4? Is it funny enough? I guess you've slightly answered that by your research about Friday nights, but do you feel it is funny enough? I mean, if you've been watching the Channel 4 trails, which I'm really thrilled to hear, then you'll see that we're currently trailing Comedy Showcase and Comedy Labs. I mean, I sit there and think, that's an amazing thing for a channel to be doing. A new investment in new comedy talent on E4, paired with, you know, big heritage names coming to write for us on the main channel. So I think there's a lot of script, good scripted stuff coming down the line. I so really cheered by Friday Night Deal. The new series of Pete versus Life looks great. Uh, Gremlin Ham will eventually write a new series of IT Ground for us. So there's lots of good comedy in the mix. But I think what's been interesting in the conversation I've had recently with, with Shane, our head of comedy, is I think we should operate right across that spectrum of what's funny, from what Channel 4 is famous for, the niche, the cult, the you know, slightly uh, more out there comedy, right through to shows that can play at 9 or 9.30. And one of the striking things about Friday Night Dinner's success, or indeed Phone Shop on E4, is that they're not radical, but they are brilliantly judged gems of comedy that sit very comfortably in the schedule too. So I think we need a real range. My Big Fat Gypsy Wedding, brilliant hit. I mean, huge ratings for you, highest rated show of the year, 9.7 million. I mean, brilliant for that, that sort of show. Why, why was it successful? Are you confident that you didn't betray um, those people? It was an accurate portrayal. It wasn't just playing to extremes to, frankly, entertain everyone who isn't a part of that community. I mean, 
I think big fat gypsy wedding uh, viewing figures will be an anomaly. And if you find a single controller who said I would have confidently predicted that will do as well as X Factor and I'll eat all my own hair. I mean, I, 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 I think it was that thing that television could still do very occasionally, which is to surprise, and it utterly surprised. Mm. This is a community that we're sort of aware of at arm's length, but we'd never seen in detail. And, you know, if you've watched the series, you know that it is not done in a cheeky and irreverent way. It's quite a straight show, and it, and it does lift a lid on a community that we've never seen before. And we're continuing to work with travelling community. We've got very good feedback from them about the way in which it has changed perceptions of them as, as a sector in society. So I feel very comfortable about it. And look at your fact tent generally. I mean, you were, things like Y Spot, I felt, were, were channel defining for Channel 4. Are you looking for those big formats that will define the channel, or do you want to be more sporadic? I mean, you're always looking for those big shows, and I think you're right. I mean, my, I think Channel 4 at its best has, a, has an array of those. But, you know, look at Undercover Boss doing brilliantly for us recently. I mean, we've still got those big shows. I also think, and I'll just say this to suppliers in the room, that I have an allergy uh, around anything that involves swapping lives. I mean, uh, the number of people who come in and pitch something and they think it's Channel 4, I've got to swap one person with another. Just please don't ever do it ever again. I mean, it's just massively boring. So, um, Damn. You know, but do you know what I mean? I think, so I think what tends to happen <laughs> is people think, well, that worked, we'll just do another version of it. Uh, we're not looking to do that. I think the big prize is what the next generation of hits are. And we've got a big piece, again, from a new Scottish indie for next year called The Bank of Dave, which is looking at uh, a Scottish millionaire who feels quite strongly that how hard can it be to run a bank? He's got lots of money. He's going to set up his own bank. So it's a factual entertainment piece, which, is, which feels incredibly topical and very timely and will take us into a different sort of space again for factual entertainment. But we're still looking for big hits, definitely. Were you proud of the 10 o'clock show? Particularly with your life. news background. <laughs> Yeah, I really, really was, and I was proud of it. In a sense, I thought what was extraordinary about it was not just how confidently it landed, but for me, the bit that actually warmed the cockles of my heart was that great big sweeping jib shot over a braying crowd of 16 to 34 people cheering, wait for it, a Lib Dem MP. And you just think, did that just happen? I mean, everyone in this room knows how hard it is to get young people engaged with politics, with current affairs, and yet that show lands and is outperforming Newsnight two to one on its first TX. I mean, how extraordinary, and is delivering young people people to a program which does serious interviews about tuition fees. I mean, I think that is rather extraordinary. I think we'd tweak it if we go with it again. We well, have definitely. the same people again. Well, we're, we're in discussions with them now. I hope we will. Um, but I think that's an incredibly brave thing to have done. And to, to say we can still find room on Channel 4 to be satirical and to have a view on the world of politics and to bring young people to that, I think it's quite a big public service commitment. And uh, talking about talent generally, uh, do you, I've noticed that a lot more you're importing people who are already established, Claudia Winkham and people of all sorts of different faces. Do you still feel that it's important to, to grow your own talent? Have you got people that you think will help define in terms of viewers? What Channel 4 is. Yeah, I mean, I, I disagree with that. I, I certainly wouldn't say that we're using a lot more people. I mean, you look at someone like Jack Whitehall, for example, who you saw a bit in that tape, you know, brand new comedy talent for us appears in our comedy drama Fresh Meat this autumn, has his own entertainment show at one end of the spectrum. It's certainly true that people like Mary Portis and Jimmy Doherty uh, have started their careers elsewhere and have come to Channel 4 because they wanted a greater range for themselves creatively. They wanted to be pushed. They wanted to do a different sort of uh, programme. And I think we'll always have an opportunity to do that. But our commitment to investment in new talent is, is huge and we are growing new faces all over the place and it's one of the reasons I'm so thrilled that Katie Piper having been a big star of our documentary series um, Katie My Beautiful Face will now be developing projects exclusively for Channel 4 not in the disability space but generally as an iconic woman who's got interesting things to say about what it's like being a woman in Britain today so you know I think the two things go hand in hand a tweet coming in, how, how would you like sport to feature on the channel and I guess I'd like to ask were you disappointed at not getting Formula 1? Well, on sport, we've just appointed a, a commissioning head of sport, and that's been really interesting because it means that we're out there having conversations now with an array of minority sports uh, about potentially having a, an, a relationship with Channel 4. Huge excitement for us, of course, as the athletics in Korea start today, and that's a big moment for us. I mean, for Channel 4 to have its own unique spin on a great big global event like that, I think is really exciting. In terms of F1, I mean, it's worst kept secret in broadcasting that we were interested. Yes, we were interested. We didn't get it. Hmm. So... What would you like to see change? Are you completely happy with where it is? What are, what are your plans? What's your focus? Well, I think what's so extraordinary about the rest of the portfolio is we've just had our best ever quarter for E4 for Youngs, our best ever quarter for More for, our best ever quarter for Film for. So, I mean, it's in pretty rude health. And I think what's exciting about E4 over the past few months is for the first time ever, a channel that was defined by huge shows like The Inbetweeners and Misfits and Skins has moved into non-scripted and had real success with it. So, you know, Made in Chelsea launching as successfully as it did, really, really encouraging in terms of future direction of travel. 
uh, Tool Academy there and, and Rick at his absolute best, delivering audiences of 800,000. It is rather remarkable, and this is not something that E4 had done traditionally. I think it gives you a really clear sense that we can move very, very confidently into that space, so we will be doing that. No Big Brother, so therefore none of the spin-off shows. Yeah. Uh, that leaves, I'm sure you would say, a great opportunity, but it does leave a very sort of um, dedicated reason for people to turn to those channels. That, that reason isn't there, is it now? Yeah, but as I say, I mean, I, I look at the performance of the channel. I mean, E4 is in extraordinarily rude health and continues to be in rude health. And, you know, it's, we are not feeling the loss of it. And I think when I look at what's coming forward, whether it's sort of the national treasure that is Noel Fielding doing two big series, we've got a great new stand-up show with Chris Addison. We've got a new reality show called Sorority Girls. We've got Made in Chelsea coming back. We've got The Midnight Beast, a huge YouTube hit, who actually brought Horseberry Road to a standstill when they came in the other day, doing their first piece for us. We've got a Catlin Moran uh, a pilot in development as well. So I think there's a really rich mix but also I mean this is a channel that's always had a very good relationship with US acquisitions and I sit mm. here now and think we've not only retained Big Bang Theory America's highest rating comedy we have also got for the autumn you saw a bit of it there Zoe Deschanel's new piece New Girl which has been incredibly well received and a massive coup for us Two Broke Girls the piece that's been written by Michael Patrick King, the guy behind Sex in the City huge hopes of that in the States has been acquired for Channel 4 and for E4 so we are continuing to renew our acquisition slate as well we have shows there that are continuing to deliver audience, and we've got massive plans for investing both late night and also big thing for suppliers in the room. We're also looking for the first time at investing pre-watershed on E4 too, so there's uh -huh. an opportunity there. What sort of things? Well, I think we don't know. I mean, that's what's so exciting about it. We've never done it before, but, you know, it probably won't be scripted. It'll be non-scripted, but we've been piloting dating shows. We've been looking at various types of quizzes. You saw a glimpse there of Dirty Digest, which will be a pretty irreverent late night chat show. So there's huge potential for all sorts of pieces. How do you see the relationship between Channel 4 and, 4 and E4? How do you see those relationships working? Well, I think the luxury of this job is that you have that sort of overview, and I think that, that having worked at the BBC where the structure is slightly different, mm. I think there are huge advantages in working this way. So you can be a bit more fleet of foot and think, well, where's best for that to play? I remember very clearly, uh, early stages now, it seems, in the, in the phone hacking scandal, um, you know, obviously dispatches have been absolutely groundbreaking in terms of continuing to push that story for a broadcasting point of view. But when the first development happened, we were able to immediately repeat the dispatches on more for, we were able to up what we were doing on the news on the main channel and just think holistically about how we could be reporting that story in the best possible way. So I think going forward, it means that when you've got a standout hit like the Inbetweeners on E4, mm. you can be much more fleet of foot about saying, OK, now's the time to move that across to the main channel. And, and the fact that that sits under my leadership makes those decisions a lot easier and a lot less Can fractious. you use it as an experiment channel? Would you resist I don't, think, I don't think you do use it as an experiment channel because the great thing about the Channel 4 portfolio is there's a very clear delineation as to what each of the channels is there to do. E4 is an entertainment channel for young audiences. There's some overlap with the main channel, but one of the things I feel passionate about about the main channel is that mm. it is the fourth terrestrial channel. It still needs... I'm a, it's got to serve ABC1 audiences in 16 to 34s. We've got to drive those commercial revenues, but it needs to be a mainstream proposition as well. So what would, if it, what would you like the Jay Hunt era to be over this? How would you like to be defined? What would you like to be able to... I'm not saying you're going anywhere, by the way. Uh, what would you like to do? Well, how would you like it to be defined? What would you like I mean, I just... Think? This sounds a bit... Weird, but we had a press dinner on Thursday night, and I wish I could share it to you. Actually, we had a tape um, of what we're coming up, what we got coming up this autumn, in a lot more detail than that one. And I think there are already signs there of oh, what I want this channel to do. The fact that we've got something like the comic strip in the mix, or Ronan Bennett's new extraordinary drama about you know life on a Peckham estate, couldn't be more topical in the light of the riots. Or that we're doing Charlie Brooker, or that we've got Ten O'clock Live, or that we've got new comedy down the line. I mean, I, I think this is a time when when Channel 4's raison d'être has never been more clear to me that you need a channel in the mix that can invest in new talent, that can take risks, that's prepared to put its money where its mouth is in big genres like comedy, which a lot of the commercial broadcasters are nervous around because it fails and the return rate is so poor. You need Channel 4 out there campaigning, being mischief-making and punching authority on the nose, and that's what I hope it will become known for. So, favourite show, least favourite show? On the channel? Mm. I mean, I'm a massive Friday Night Dinner fan, it must be said, but I mean, can I have a few others? I mean, only because it's only fair to say this, they're not my commissions. Embarrassing Bodies, I used to look at from BBC One and think I'd give my back teeth for that show. To find something, I'm sorry that man thinks it's shortening his life, but to find a show which does public service health in such an entertaining way, amazing, and equally, I'd say... Not exploitative giant. in any way. I don't like think it is. I mean, you look alongside that, and this is again why it's brilliant having that involved with the multi-platform team. Our health checker site that sits alongside that and the extraordinarily groundbreaking live from the clinic that we did has now had four million people go onto it 
it to take health-related tests. We estimate that we've saved the NHS nearly £200,000 because of diagnosis around symptom checkers to do with live from the clinic. So that's, that couldn't be more public service. So I think that that, that is fantastic. Least favourite? Hmm. I mean, I wasn't a, a huge Famous and Fearless fan, I have to be honest. I wasn't. I wasn't. And it's not coming back, so that's what happens if she doesn't like you. <laughs> um, <laughs> and what is, because they, they probably need to know this, what is your favourite way to receive a pitch and your worst pitch? What's your best ever pitch? I feel like I've been doing these interviews for so long that everybody already knows oh, this about me. Oh, thank you very much. No, 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 I don't mean that. no, I don't mean that. I just mean I think people know this about my pitching. My least favourite, you will know this, is being read to from PowerPoint because reading is a key requirement of my job, so I, I can read. So that, that sends shivers down my spine. Um, I mean, I, people work in different ways, don't they? I mean, I, I've always thought if you're a supplier, then to a certain extent, you are throwing mud at a wall. We sit here holding a lot more of the cards. We've got the audience data. We know what's worked and what hasn't worked. So I always think the best way of going about it is what's your idea? What's the germ of the idea? And let's have a conversation. And then I think you can come up with something that's going to be really compelling. I never expect someone to come in with a laminated document saying, I've signed the talent, let's mm. put it on the telly. And I can't remember the last time someone came in with a show like that that we went to air with. So... I think the germ of the idea, the insight, some imaginative take on something, the start of a conversation, and that's one of the reasons why I'm going out talking to people, why the heads of department and the commissioning editors are travelling around the country so having conversations. So that's real. People, it's, it's real, I think yeah. it's, it's very hard to say that about the German idea, but you're very big, and it's very hard sometimes to come with somebody with an unformed idea, isn't it? But you well, don't I, fit I don't it think in. that's true. I mean, I, think the, I mean, the other thing I hate more than anything is people who come in and say, I've got 39 things I feel really passionate about. I really doubt that. You've got to give everything a try. Yeah, I, mean, I always say to people, I always get the feeling they come in, they think if we get her on a bad day when she's so tired, maybe by the time we get to 37, she'll just give in. I mean, you know, genuinely, be passionate about it, because if you're not passionate about it, you don't really care about it, I'm not going to care about it either, and nor is any other commissioner. So I think there will be a small raft of ideas that you do feel passionate about, and I've said this to all the Indies, if it's that thing that you really think, I'll hurl myself out a window if I'm not allowed to make this, then great, let's have the conversation, because... Mm. It's the ones that feel a bit... I mean, the, the, the meetings that my heart sinks about are when someone comes in, slouches in the chair and goes, what do you want? And you just think, well... <laughs> yeah. do you, aren't you, don't we work in telly because you're excited by ideas? You must have your own ideas that you're excited about too. Let's have a conversation about that. Well, we got loads of good tweaked questions, actually, but also want to give everybody here a chance to ask some questions as well. I don't know if anybody... We've got a microphone facility, I think. Someone's about to leap up. Uh, has anybody got any questions they'd like to ask Jay? And I can intersperse some with some of the tweeted ones too. Brilliant, nobody. We now realise that the microphones weren't working and no one's heard a single thing we said. Oh, um, hello, <laughs> who, who are you? Probably be heard from here. Um, just roughly, could you give me a budget range on, on, on what's up with the, uh, with the entertainment shows, the low and the high? Can you just briefly tell us who you are as well? Uh, do you know what? I honestly can't, and not because I'm being evasive, because I think the whole point is, if you say that at one end of the spectrum we might be looking for an 11 o'clock show, the other end of the spectrum we might be looking for a big physical show that will work for an audience at 8 o'clock on a Friday, and the other end of the spectrum we might look for the groundbreaking event that would sustain Channel 4 for future summers, I can't. But in a sense you should regard that as liberating. We have money to spend there. Come in with whatever scale idea you have and we'll have the conversation. While they're thinking, here's a tweet question. Uh, what happened to More 4? It used to be the home of adult entertainment and now it's a place to watch Back to Back Come Dine With Me. Well, I mean, you don't watch Come Back to Back Come Dine With Me. I mean, I think at the end of the day, More 4, and it's something we've been talking about a lot, actually. I think it started as a position, position in a particular way. It is in a slightly different form now. It is predominantly a factual and lifestyle channel. But what's interesting is how extraordinarily compelling it is for viewers. It's just had six of its best ever performing months in 2011. So the audience likes it, but I think it's a legitimate point that we may not be positioning it as well as we might be, and we're spending quite a lot of time talking about that at the moment. And what's a bigger challenge for you, filling the gap of Friends on E4 or Big Brother on Channel 4? I mean, they're both challenges in different ways. I mean, what's interesting about Friends, I assume all of you, uh, or maybe you're not as tragic as I am, have looked at the overnights, but the new set of overnights show uh, the percentage decline of a show year on year, and Friends on E4 last night was down 49% on what it was doing this time last year. And I think, I was just reminding myself this morning that that show uh, has been repeated on E4 since 2004, mm. which is a staggering fact if you let it hang in the air for a minute. For seven years, we've been running repeats, and yes, they've been great, but I absolutely think for a channel that's defined by the new and the different and the groundbreaking, for the channel that grew the in-betweeners into a huge hit movie, then it's right to be moving on. And 
I feel very comfortable What's going to happen to Inbetweeners, by the way? Because it's kind of the end of the time for them, isn't it? Uh, in terms of their school life, and they've got a big movie. And so will you find a way of bringing them back? Will you have a new invented group of well, Inbetweeners? Well, we saw... Or? I mean, what's great is quite a lot of them are still working for Channel 4. We've got Chickens, one of our comedy showcases that they're in. Um, James is in The Hunt for Tony Blair. Joe Thomas is in Fresh Meat. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's just such an extraordinary standout hit, that. I mean, I think short of sort of handcuffing them, we'll, we'll be lucky to retain them and they'll probably all pop up in Hollywood. But... I sit there and think, never underestimate what a fourth channel for is for good. When you sit there and think this is the germ of a show that grew on in between, uh, grew on E4 over series, will end up on current projections to be probably the biggest British comedy that we've had in the cinemas for many, many years. And what an extraordinary thing to have had happen. And I think that's why Channel 4 is important. You need somewhere in the broadcasting landscape that can take those sorts of risks, can invest in talent over time and grow these great big hits. Hmm. Any other questions? Hello. Mr. Shallot at the back there, look. Waving furiously. Thank you, Jonathan Shallot. To, next year we have two big national events, the Olympics, Paralympics, and the Queen's Diamond Jubilee. Are Channel 4 planning any initiatives in those areas, and are there still opportunities for people to pitch you with? Yes, I mean, I think not around the Olympics for fairly obvious reasons. I don't think there's huge value in me scheduling Olympics-related programming around an 80% share on BBC One, if I'm honest with you. But the Paralympics, obviously, I mean, I, one of the things I feel really strongly about is we've got such a great track record of broadcasting innovative programming for the disabled community. I don't want our Paralympics to coverage to go out and just feel like it's a very, very straight take on the event. So we are looking for accompanying programming. And if you've got great ideas that will sit alongside that, please do pitch them. We've got big commitments to documentaries already. So I don't want a huge amount, but there is, there is an opportunity there. In terms of the Jubilee, I mean, really, really good question. I mean, we've, we've done quite a lot of work recently about thinking what is an alternative take on the Jubilee. I think we've probably got it now, uh, but I might be wrong. Uh, so there's probably a waffer thin gap for, for pitching there. Hello? There we go, gentlemen. Yep. I'm just wondering what your current thinking on daytime is, and I'm wondering whether you intend to spend more money. Yeah, well, we've just your... put two and a half million pounds into daytime um, for the rest of this year. I mean, uh, my, I mean, sorry, I mean, on top of existing funding rather than that's, that's it in its totality. And hugely big fact, 40% of that spend has gone to Scotland. So, I mean, I think my feeling about daytime, and it's probably unsurprising given my background as a daytime controller, is that Channel 4 was in slight danger of looking like it found a load of things in a drawer and then it put them on the television. Um, it should be as compelling as every other part of the day. There needs to be a clear USP. We know that the audience will be slightly older and a slightly different demographic from what what's available. What would the USP be? Sorry, just well, I, th I think we just need to look at something that's got a slightly more irreverent tone, but I don't think we'll be drifting dramatically away from key lifestyle areas. I mean, property and food are still compelling for viewers in daytime, and we will be part of that. But if you look at the tonality of something like Coach Trip or Come Dine With Me or Four in a Bed, something that can feel a bit more irreverent can fit in the mix as well. But I'm also looking for successor brands for quizzes like Deal or No Deal. You know, you've constantly got to be looking for what your strategy is for the moment. I hope it won't happen for many years when the bottom falls out of something like that. So we're looking for quizzes, we're looking for lifestyle programming. Uh, and we're Would looking you ever have a live show? Would you yes, ever we're also have a looking live, at a live show. this morning, yeah. things like that? No, we're not going to copy this morning. No, OK. okay. What about Daybreak? No, we're not going to copy okay. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> you talked about uh, Hughes Fish Fight. What other space do you think there is for campaigns and how far do you think Channel 4 can be a campaigning channel? I think it can play an incredibly important part, and it's one of the reasons that I was excited about coming to the channel. So for this, this autumn, for example, we've got a huge homelessness season, which is built around a, a tag, give us your empties, and that's give us your empty homes. There are a million empty homes in this country and two million families with nowhere to live. I think for a westernised society, that's an extraordinary scandal, and we should do something about it. And that will sit alongside a really exciting, innovative online tool, which will allow people to register empty homes and get them back into circulation, housing the people who need them most. So we can absolutely be campaigning. Jimmy Doherty's big season for next year will look around the ethics of food and the cost of food production at a point when people are looking in their shopping trolley thinking, can I afford to make the sort of judgments I might have been taking a year ago around animal husbandry? He'll be doing the ultimate consumer guide on what compromises you make when you buy value ranges. So those sorts of things, I think, are typical. Drugs Live is another one that we've got coming out, which puts Channel 4 on the, on the front foot around drugs policy in this country. I would love to be getting more of those ideas through the door. I mean, there's a nervousness from people pitching them, and I, I would love to think that we should, every week of the year, have something interesting to say about what's going on in Britain today. And, you know, please do pitch them, because we're looking for them all the time. 
Or other examples, Sri Lanka's killing fields. I mean, for us to have had a show like that, which is called The Reverberations It Has and been discussed in the White House, amazing. So it may not be a whole season. It just might be an extraordinary piece of television. There's, a, there's something which claims to be a genuine tweet here. I want someone to put their hand up if they really did tweet this. Kate, where did you get your jacket from? The answer is Keith Chegrin, 1985, by the way. <laughs> but, um, but I have... They're suggesting the producers that we use this to wrap up. We have got to wrap up soon, so have a think if, uh, if you want a question. But my question, I always like to ask sort of Hollywood stars, particularly, something gives, gives, which you are, let me tell you, <laughs> in the terms of, uh, of controllers. Um, what, what would we do, what would we see if we found you on a Sunday? What do you like to relax and enjoy doing personally? I always think it's This is coming back to, to shoes, know. isn't it? Definitely. It's back to shoes um, and jackets. I mean, I suspect it's not dissimilar to your life. I have two small children. Mm. Uh, we go cycling a lot. I've become slightly tragically obsessed with having a raised garden bed and keeping an eye on my tomatoes and, co tomatoes and courgettes. <laughs> I bake an enormous amount. Uh, I love cooking. We have people round a lot. Um, I mean, that's, you know, sometimes I'm viewing stuff if I'm really boringly honest. So... You know, I have a life just the same as everybody else. I'm just a mum with two young kids. So that's all the things she loves, by the way. And if, when you're here next year, uh, when you're here next year, what would you like to be saying about Channel 4, apart from the fact that it's all been marvellous? What would be your big thing? I don't say we've only gone and done it. That's what I mean. Yeah. You know, I think next year, you know, we've got a long way to go. And I think, you know, I look at where ITV is now, and I think it's taken Peter three years to get to that point. And these things take time. It will take time. But I'm incredibly encouraged by the stuff that we've got coming down the line. I think we've got a, a really great commissioning team who are out there talking to people about great ideas. And I hope by this time next year, the schedule will feel different uh, and that we'll have a greater array of things on telly, but also that every week they'll feel like there's a story around Channel 4. There's something interesting, new, innovative, different, groundbreaking that we're putting on the telly, and that's my real ambition. Jayha, thank you very much.